Yo, what is happening, everybody that tunes into the Culture Podcast? Thank you so much for joining me uh, today. I'm your host, Keenan Jerome Floyd. I'm rolling solo dolo today, so I'm doing the talking and the interviewing of the host and the clips and all of that stuff. So you're going to have to bear with me. We're going to see if I have um, motor skills or I, if I can pat my head and rub my belly at the same time. That's basically what we're trying to figure out <laughs> at this point in our juncture. I hope everyone has had an amazing, a good weekend. Uh, Pride Month just ended Juneteenth, Black Music Month and all that stuff is over. Um, but uh, we're here July 1st, which is actually an important month because this is my birthday month, Cancer Gang in the building. Um, and yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be a good month. Before we go any further, I would like to um, make an announcement for those of you that are in the West Hartford, Connecticut, and New York City area in September. Uh, the first three shows of my self-imposed tour, uh, Everything's Under Control, is going to be happening on July, uh, my bad, on September 14th and 15th. So September 14th, I will be doing two shows at the Elbow Room in West Hartford, Connecticut. And then on September 15th, I will be doing one show at the St. Mark's Comedy Club. I will be headlining all three shows. I will be running my hour because I'm expecting to record an album or something sometime this year. Um, but make sure that you guys grab those tickets. I will have the link in the link in the bio on the Instagram cultured pod on Instagram and on Facebook. And also if you um, at the bottom of this video on YouTube, you're going to actually be able to get the link as well. Um, make sure you are following us on the Instagram at cultured pod and also um, subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, cultured podcast. And uh, make sure that you like, leave a comment, and let other people know about this podcast. I have a very, 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 very special guest on today's episode. Uh, I think I've known this person since I moved to Los Angeles. Um, this person might have to tell the story of how we met because I don't remember exactly. But uh, this person is a very good friend of mine. Very, very funny, is a hard worker, is doing everything that needs to be done to become successful in Hollywood, not just Black Hollywood, but Hollywood in general. Uh, so I want you guys to give a cordial welcome to my friend, Fatima Talia. Hey. What's up? Hey, what's going on? How are you? I'm good. How are you? Man, busy. So busy lately. In a good way, though. In a good way? In a great tell way. Us, uh, tell us what's going on. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Fatima. You're uh, from Chicago. Chicago. What Chicago. part of Chicago are you from? I grew up on the South Side. On the South Side. So you're really from Chicago. I'm from the South Side. South Side. I grew up uh, in the South Suburbs, and I also lived in the hundreds for majority of my life growing up in Chicago. Okay, cool. It's nice to have someone that's not from like Schaumburg or something, and they're like, "Yo, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> yo, I'm from these mean streets." I admit, I admit that I'm from the suburbs. Like, I I'm originally from Mobile. Oh, so, but like, uh -oh. when people really I ask like me about stuff, I, mean, I, I dress like a substitute bit. teacher anyway. So. <laughs> oh wait, do you still? You feel, I don't know. You kind of broke up. Like okay. you kind of. I I feel slow motion with it, and I was just like, "Oh, how do I fix this?" I don't know. Oh, no. I, okay, I, think, I was like, I oh, I don't I know. Okay. All right, you kind of went in and out. What, you said something broke up. Okay, you were yeah, like, I, I, I moved something on my computer and it slowed everything oh, down. Oh, I was like, what did you say? It was like, tick, 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 tick. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm from the South originally, but I grew up in the suburbs uh, uh -huh. up north in Pennsylvania. So, you know, I do rep Mobile, Alabama, but at the same time, too, I dress like a substitute teacher. So, I I can't, you know, I can't really, I don't try to be something that I'm not, but it's interesting how there's so much culture associated with being from someplace, right? Like repping your, repping where you're from, like for mm -hmm. real, right? 
And I don't necessarily think that it has to be like a big city. I think everyone should be proud of where they're from, right? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't say I wasn't proud. Did I say that? No, no, no. I'm not saying you said that. Oh, I was saying, like, yeah. I was like, I'm, saying I in general, I'm saying in general, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, I'm from like this little small town. Oh, no, I'm know. from, uh, I feel like I'm from a big city. Like I grew up in the city. Yeah. Yeah, outside yeah. like where i mean especially i grew up uh in entertainment so like a lot of the really great chicago comics i had saw them in passing or was around them yeah well what do you mean you grew up in entertainment uh my most of my family is in entertainment like 90 percent of them nine percent of them are they into um music uh comedy mm-hmm. acting music yeah yeah because yeah. chicago's huge yeah, That's mostly crazy. music in my family. Um, like, so I, I grew up more understanding entertainment a little different than anybody else. Like, I when before I got to LA, I was already sad. So, mm-hmm. um, do you have like a particular project or anything that you? Okay, so before I get to that, is there a particular discipline that you're more enthusiastic about? Because you're multi you're like a hyper, you're, what was it, what you call it, um, multi yeah. So is there like a particular discipline that you favor over the other, or did you start in one discipline and then it ended up leading to the other uh, things uh, that you do? No, I think I just, growing up in a family of entertainment, I was always artsy, so it wasn't like, looked at as a strange thing. So for me, I went to an art school growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, And I like, you know, I've always done this, like forever, like probably like grammar school. I was into theater and different things like that. By the time I got into high school, I was writing and creating theater shows and running a radio show in high school. By the time I was in college, uh, I was a theater major in college. And then my family, like I said, is all were in entertainment as music. So my claim to fame in my early stages of entertainment was I was background singing and uh, working as a background dancer. So like, yeah, for me, it was just like, this is just life. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. This is this is the norm to me. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's where to answer that. So so like where did comedy come in? Like in that that's equation. crazy that you say that. Um, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for real, it didn't. Um, I don't know if this is just God or just this is where I was supposed to be. I guess my my initial what I wanted out of a career. I knew I wanted to be an entertainer, but my initial was like, oh, I I want to be on TV. I want to be Rudy mm-hmm. <laughs> or whatever. Or I want to be Nia Long, you know, because that was the only black female that was brown skinned that I felt looked like me that I was like, oh, that makes sense. But comedy was never a thing. I didn't look at it as a career. Even growing up, the fact that my cousin who went to high school with D-Ray, he lived around the corner from Mm -hmm. her at the time. He was, I saw him a lot or. Little Rail was around a lot and Dion Cole was around a lot. Like all the comedians that everybody cherish, like not cherishes, but like really think are dope from Chicago. They were just normal in my life. I've saw them around. They don't know me, but I remember like growing up in my family with entertainment and my cousins and stuff, we would see all these comedians. So yeah, I, I was around with jokes and notes was a thing in Chicago. Remember how that was a big deal? And Damon, uh, I think it's Damon Williams or something. He was a really big deal. But like, mm-hmm. no, I never looked at that as a career or ever was like, this is something I want to do. I was really close friends. I have really close friends with Kelly Howard uh, from Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, I was being an actress and she was a stand up. And that was the closest I've ever gotten to stand up, to seeing what that world was. So even then, I wasn't even trying to do it. How I got here was I got to L.A. I moved to L.A. in 2012 and I was trying to be an actor. And I took an improv class. And when I took that, the instructor was like, oh, you should do stand up. And it kind of snowballed into that. Even then, I was like, no, I didn't even know what that was. So, like, LA, 
<laughs> I don't even know how to say it. Like I, because it wasn't like a big stand up city like New York. Like I just kind of fell into it. And then at that time that I fell into it, LA was a good time to fall into comedy. Yeah. Because it ain't now. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. At that time. I mean, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that often. Um, the whole you people come to LA. People don't come to LA to do stand up anymore. No. Yeah, right. No. And to be honest with you, people shouldn't. It's not really a stand up city. However, um, a lot of times it helps in like I wish I had taken improv more seriously when I was in high school because I think it would help me like m- more sooner in stand up because like I really admire stand ups that can really perform on stage, right? Like I really, mm-hmm. I really enjoy watching stand ups that really use the whole area that's given to them on stage, right? And they really make it a show for people, right? right. Um, so that's definitely the the benefit I see of you know coming to LA and then having like a team behind you that's somewhat encourages you to pursue stand-up because you also who, who has a team behind them pursuing you a team you have that? a team behind me no because you, like, you said like who has a team behind you pursuing it I'm like who said who has well that? i mean there's like people have teams and then they tell them to try stand like in in two months mm. the hawk took girl Haley welch whatever her name is it's going to be doing who is that Oh, I don't know. This she's, I don't. she's the she's the well. I'm glad you don't know. She's the now <laughs> oh my God. viral person that said hawk to the guys like, "How do you please your man?" And she said, "You got hot two on that." She's from like Tennessee. And yeah, it's too much going on outside. He's the one that's me. like hot two. You got a hot two on that thing. Now she's blown up. Shaq has found her because Shaq finds all the internet, the new internet women. <laughs> Is that what's going on? See, I don't know. Found her. She's uh she has management. I don't think it's like a big man, but she has like management. So it's like it seems like stand up is the beacon that people try to push their clients first. Uh, oh, I, I feel like I've heard well, I work in social media. Mm-hmm. That's my like day job outside of uh stand up and I do hear that from like working in there. I, I run past so many influencers, and a lot of them are always talking about how their management or agents are pushing them to do like stand up or tours. So I guess that's a normal thing. I don't know. To be honest, but, for somebody like myself that didn't plan on being a stand up, uh, I see it really different than other people. Uh, I think that's the cool part for me. Somebody that didn't plan on it and is actually doing it when you see people that are being told like you should do it. I I personally feel like this is not something you could just say go do tomorrow. I'll be right for real. I I don't think that I know everything about stand up, but I do know you got You got to be born with some part of this. Mm-hmm. I I don't I don't think you could just be like an internet star and then be like boom I'm finna go do stand up. And I honestly don't even think even if somebody teaches you or you go to a class that you could still be a good stand up. No. Well, you have that's to That's just that's my opinion. I don't know what nobody else's opinion is, but for me personally, being a girl that didn't come from any form of background of this at all. I don't have any influence or any person in my family or any comic that was my influence or anything like that. You got to just be good at being a storyteller. I think well, we honest, live in a world now where everybody could do whatever the fuck you want to do. You could be a chef tomorrow if you want to, if you just want to be an internet chef, and you could pop off and be better than the motherfucker that went to school. You just got to be born with certain... It's got to be... Stand-up to me is not... Some well, you shit can't, you could just... You, you can't Go learn ahead. how to be funny. You, you can't, can't learn. You can't that. go to you can't learn how to have charisma. You can't learn how to well, be Well, I will tell you this. You can learn cuz I've had moments where I've crossed paths people in my like, classes. You can learn how to place your punchline better. Someone can teach you that. 
but no one can teach you to have the art of being able to go on a stage and be by yourself and confidently tell a story. I'm saying that because I'm somebody that didn't ever expect that and didn't have that. But the fact that I can do that says there's something specifically with me says I can do that. I don't think that you could just be like, boom, because I, I've seen people, you've seen it. You've seen people go on stage and you could tell that this is a written story versus the people that can go on stage and be like, fuck it. I'm going to talk about what's going on in my life. And it's still funny. It's two different things. Yeah, because you can't, again, you can't really my be bad. taught. You can't really <laughs> be taught. Balloon. To be charismatic and you can't really be taught to connect to people. Connecting, mm -hmm. connecting with your audience is almost 80% of the battle, in my opinion. Um, what I will say, what I will say is this, when I started doing stand up, social media didn't exist. And it was around the time it was, it was that turning point where all of the superstars that we have now really were starting to, they were, they were young, but they were still starting. They were starting on their path. Like it's when mm -hmm. Kev, Hart was known as Lil Kev, and it was when Bill Burr was still, you know, it was it was maybe a couple of years before the Chappelle show. So like all those people were like on the Chappelle show. Like Dave was like the biggest out of all of them at the time because he got a show and he was in a couple movies, right? So like mm -hmm. it was around the time where you were just and and I didn't understand it at the time because I had grown up listening to like Bill Cosby and like Flip Wilson and like Richard Pryor and. Mm -hmm. and 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 people like that but i really didn't understand like what they were doing like the like the concept of stand-up comedy wasn't really like a thing for me right, but, right, right um you know watching like comedy central back then and seeing like premium blend and patrice o'neill and 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 mm -hmm. bill burr and they all had this like camaraderie where it's like they were all just in new york just rolling together right mm -hmm. and now you kind of see that they've kind of hit like within the last like five years they've really hit their mark the majority of them hit their mark like in superstardom like dave wasn't doing arenas like six years ago you know what i mean like you, you, you know what i'm saying so it was like they really are like hitting their stride now so every time i hear like a newer comedian come into the scene and then they go i have to be funny right now like they don't say it like that but it's like the attitude is I got to be funny right now because you have the social media aspect where it's like, I can get the attention. I can get the shows because I have the numbers, but stand up is still like a time. It's like being like you mentioned being a chef earlier. You can be a chef on the internet on Instagram, but you can't go in hell's kitchen. Like Gordon, you know what I mean? Like when you're in the situation where, where you have to, where you have to perform, it's just something that takes time. And I think sometimes we get like discouraged or well, I speak for my case. Sometimes we get like discouraged because we see how people are moving or how the industry is like moving in like a certain direction. And we're like desperately trying to like keep up with it. But I still think it still stands. I still think there's a, there's a time that has to be dedicated to the craft. And then, and then once you get to that point, you'll look back and just say, Oh, wow. Like, I was here and now I'm here. Like I actually took it seriously. And I think that time. that's the problem. We don't live in that world anymore. And I think a lot of people are still stuck there. Yeah. And so this is where the problem comes in. Well, I this think is what we're, this is what we're seeing more of in, in Los Angeles versus New York or well, Chicago, in Chicago or any other space that is with comedians who are just getting better and growing. Yeah. We live in the superficial world. So the things that we see here, for example, for myself, I don't really, I have never actually, and you know, this is just my ego talking, but I don't give any credit for that. But out of the 13 years of me being in LA and the 11 years of doing comedy, I've never looked at it as a popularity contest. Everybody that sees me out, I'm usually by myself. 
and I get on stage and I do my thing and I kiki for a minute and I leave. That's always been my energy. I agree. But in LA, it's such a facade type of shit where everybody's like, well, it only matters on what type of flyers you're on or what type of shows you're doing or who you cool with or all of that. And that fucks with everybody. Mm-hmm. And it makes people respond a certain way. It makes people act a certain way. It makes people egos go crazy a certain way. And that's one of the things I really, coming from a family of entertainment, that has been the struggle for me of being in LA, of seeing how people will literally kill themselves or throw somebody else under the bus for scraps. That I've, I've grown up in this industry, I, I, literally. Like I was raised in it. So I know what this industry is and what it does and how important certain things are and how important certain things aren't. And I've always carried myself in that way. And I get no credit for that. Like you, like that's the thing that sometimes <laughs> makes me laugh about LA. I find it that like I have a very small amount of friends. I wouldn't even call them friends, a very small amount of acquaintances that I roll with. And when I'm out, I do what it, I do what it do. I've gotten to this, not with a team. Like there's a lot of comments in LA that got like four and five other comments they roll with that they get on show. Fatima Talia has literally been Fatima Talia. There has not been Fatima Talia in the gang. Mm-hmm. There has not been Fatima Talia and them. So we're not gonna see so, no Fatima Talia and friends. <laughs> Shows. I I I've managed, like I said, this whole time to be a very like kept to myself person. Like no one can ever say that about me in this town. No one can ever be like, oh, she rode with XYZ. That's why she's on this. Or she hangs out with, or she's this. Everybody knows me as just being good. That Mm -hmm. is one thing that I can stand on. I'm human. I'm not great all the time, but I think the 13 years of being in LA, I've just been good on stage and that has given me the name that I've given, but I've never been in a space where I feel like the internet runs me or I feel like I got to do or be certain part of certain groups to get there and not think that's what LA's problem is with comedy. <laughs> like everybody, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I find it like, do they really want to be great or do they just want to be on a certain flyer? No lies detected. Anyone, I don't know. I'll, this is going to be replayed. If you see uh Fatima Talia's name on the show, go and see her. She's very funny. <laughs> I think the first time I met um Yeah, met you were saying that. I'm like, how do we meet? Oh, we, we met, met during pandemic. The pandemic, because I was hosting the show in the park. Yeah. I believe. And you used mm-hmm. to come to every show. Yep. 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 Yeah, we became pandemic was a good time for me. Uh that was a good time for me. I yeah. think that I think pandemic was I was just talking about somebody this the other day. Pandemic for me was a very free free space. That was the first time for me where it was just like, it's not about what's going on outside. It's just everything's over with. So just be you. It was good mm-hmm. times. I love I love pandemic. Well, I'm glad yeah. I, we met and we were able to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we met it. What was the name of that park you was on the show? Pan Pacific. Pan Pacific Park. Then everybody wanted to do shows at Pan Pacific Park after that. Because mm-hmm. I took a break. I took a break and I came back and they're like, What was oh, the name of your show? Huh? What was the name of the show? I forget. It was like yeah, Comedy Pan Pacific. Yeah. I, I forget what it was called, but they were like, Oh, yeah, you can't have your space back because. Uh, Who were you running that show with? I forget. Who was you um, I ran it with. Oh, I think I ran it with Carol the first time. And then I. Oh, yes, right. Carol. I was like, Who are you running it with? It was someone else. Someone else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You and it. y'all, y'all had a y'all had a good show. That's right. It yeah. was fun. People came. I'm trying, was, I was trying to remember. Like, yeah, okay. It was Saturday afternoon. People came, and we had repeat customers. There was like oh, five. It was people. a lot of yeah. There was five people that would come to every show, mm-hmm. every Saturday, and it was like, mm-hmm. and then I don't know. I they started doing other shows, but you know, it is what it is. It was fun. Um. Before we get into the movie, there was one. You have many credits. <laughs> Before you. we get into the movie, there was you have many credits. Um, laugh that. tracks. You're currently on a recurring role on Killing It with Craig Robinson yeah. and Rail Battle. 
Yeah. Um, on Peacock, by the way, check that out. That's yeah. a big deal. Um, but one of the credits that you have is Django Unchained. <laughs> yeah, that's and, my first credit. And I, it's one of my favorite movies. I'm, I'm assuming it was you were on set and all that stuff. I would like to know what was that experience like. Filming with like Jamie Foxx, Samuel Jackson, Quentin Tarantino on a plantation. Like what <laughs> what was that experience like? Man, it was so fun. That's crazy to even say. <laughs> 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 to say out loud, like, yo, it was the most lit slave event. Um <laughs> <laughs> no, uh man, such a cool story for me. Um How do I say this? I was an actor for years. I went to college as a theater major. Uh, when I moved to LA, I hit the ground running fast. Man, God is good. When I got here, I got a lot of big roles really fast in my career. And that was one of my first ones. That was a very accidental role that I got that ended up, they end up cutting apart, but I had an actual part. Um, I auditioned for it through just a friend of a friend that knew someone. Um, it was a very funny scene that, in that they end up cutting. Uh, I was a slave that was in trouble for some shit, uh, but it was with Jamie Foxx and um, uh, I forget the guy's name, I'm really terrible names, but I, I was a slave at uh, Candyland mm -hmm. when they came to, I guess that first time he came and he was, you know, the slave or whatever, but it was super fucking fun. Uh, Quentin Tarantino, great guy. Uh, I'm sure he won't remember me. There were so many people, but it was a, he was easy and fun to work with. Uh, again, I'm terrible with names. The producer that was on that particular scene that I was on was great. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I met a lot of people. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to Jamie much, but he was cool. Um, it was just it was a it was a really cool experience for my first experience for Hollywood. Um, yeah, that's all I really got to say about that. It was a big credit for me. No, that's what's up. <laughs> it was I, a major. I think, I yeah. think when I when I saw it, because I saw it on your IMDb, I think, a, like a year or so ago. Okay, you just full oh, disclosure. You just okay. Full disclosure: when I when I am writing projects, I'm like looking up my friends. You know what I mean? Because like when I be when I be writing, I be thinking about like people and like whose faces like pop into my head when I'm like doing characters and stuff. So so just just so you know, and everyone else, I be like on your IMDb's, like looking like, oh, what, what's <laughs> what's Fatima doing? You know what I mean? Um, so I saw Django, and I have wanted to ask you about that ever since. Ever since I saw it, I was oh like, man, it was oh. just a really cool experience for me. Like I got, and they also I got a chance to do the photo shoot. Um, or I got a chance to do some stuff with photo shoot. It was a really cool time for me. Just put it that way. It was it was fun to watch. Uh, very early stage of my career where like acting. I mean, I feel like I've always been an actor, but it was a very early stage of far from where I am now. I feel like I'm like so much better, but mad cool. Uh, everybody on set was cool. I've been lucky when I think about it. I've been lucky enough to be a part of some amazing sets. Usually, sets not everything is always that happy. Mm -hmm. But that was a happy, from what I, at least for me, it was a pretty happy experience. Yo, that's what's up. Thanks for sharing, sharing that story with us. <laughs> All right. Now, let's get to the bread and the butter yeah. of what we're here for. We're here to talk about movies, black cinema. That's mm -hmm. what culture is all about. I love movies. You love movies. And the movie that you have chosen is a little movie called Love Jones. And One let's of my Check out the trailer but I will right give now. You ten cool points for nostalgia's sake. I am not trying to meet another man at this time. You and I should uh, get together sometime and have a drink. I don't think that'll be a very good idea. Hey. Hmm. Persistence. Be surprised how far I can get you. Love Jones. Yes, it's for you. Wait, 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 wait a minute. You made breakfast. <laughs> Directed by Theodore Witcher. Uh oh, my bad. No, I, <laughs> I, I love I this trailer. 
I rewatched this movie today and it got hot and steamy in this apartment. Let me tell you something. That what? that movie. So so when what I watched happened? It, huh? No, so, he was like, yeah, I had seen me. I was like, what happened? <laughs> when when I rewatched the trailer, when I watched the trailer, they make it seem like Bill Bellamy is like a huge part of the movie. Mm-hmm. Like I think I think they were coming off of the booty call, how to be a player, whatever, like that fame, because Bill Bellamy was like a comedian that was like really handsome. He had like sex appeal. So they really make it seem like he's like a strong second lead in this movie. And he's barely in the movie. He's barely in the movie. <laughs> but you know what's weird? You know what's weird though? It's like being an entertainer and knowing what we go through and seeing stuff that like because for me, it's like when you're in Chicago and you live in the suburbs or wherever I was living, you don't really know the world that you're seeing on TV. Yeah. Now that we live it, you're like, oh, I like as just think about what your mindset would be if you was Bill Bellin. You like, y'all are barely put me in a movie. But the fact that Bill Bellamy at that time started blowing up and like how to be a player started popping off, they used him mm-hmm. as a way to promote that fucking film. He was barely in the film. And you think about that shit when you in it now, you like, man, that's the shit that be having, you know, because really, in reality, he made the film funny. Yeah. 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 And if yeah. you think about it, like Bill Bellamy, did he really get his flowers? Because that motherfucker had some hits back in the nineties. He had good movies. How to be a player was a shit. Well, <laughs> I keep talking about on this podcast. I keep talking about often how the nineties was a very different era in black entertainment. It was a very, it was lit. It was lit. The movies were great. The movies were entertaining. All we we still quote all the movies now from the nineties. It seems, I'll get into this later, but it seems like now there's a superficiality of blackness in entertainment that, to me, it doesn't feel authentic. And I think that's what, like... Because we only have two or three people that's doing it right. Yeah. We were never, the 90s was a major time from music to culture to TV. We haven't seen anything like it since. Let's just be clear. It ain't... We ain't got no juice. We ain't got no clockers. <laughs> ain't none and, of that and, going on right now. Like you got your, we can name on our fingers black films that are legendary right now. Nothing compared to what we were experiencing in the nineties. Let's be real. Well, I I think it's one of the reasons I think that is because I think blackness is more diverse now. I think there's, I think. I, I do think there's a lot more um I think there's a lot more black people from the suburbs, younger people that are coming from the suburbs. I do think that there's a lot okay. more biracial black people. I do think there's there's black okay. people with different experiences. I do think there's a lot more black people from other countries that are coming that are trying to tell the black American story. So which is fine. It, which is fine, but it's kind of like it's a package of because you know this, like being black in Hollywood, it's a package of, well, I think this is like what black people want to see. So I'm going to package it this way. But then you can kind of tell, mm-hmm. like when it comes out, you're like, okay, I see where you're going, but it's missing. There's some there's some seasoning that's missing. The risk is hit home. Mm. What do you, you, you feel that way about? story black stories now some some of them hmm. some some of them like i'm from the south and hmm. i went to family reunions four black grandparents family drama um aunties uncles great aunties uncles um gatherings out in the middle of the land that my grandparents owned history and all that stuff and even to me, Tyler Perry movies seem to have a lot too much sauce on them. Like, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. okay. I, I'll be this- honest with you. I don't know a lot about Tyler Perry stuff. I, I haven't been like a big Tyler Perry fan. And I'm not saying like I'm not a fan, but like I just don't watch. Yeah. Like I that. mean, but- you're you're not missing anything. But at the same time, like when I watch, I'm like, okay, fr- as a person from the South, I'm like, this is kind of, this is a bit exaggerated. 
right? So, long yeah. story short, I miss the movies from the 90s. I especially miss Black Love movies from the 90s. Black romantic comedies. Um, why is Love Jones your favorite movie? Well, for starters, it's shot in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first time I ever saw this movie, um, I thought it was great because it showcased a lot of really great Chicago staples and different things that are like cool in Chicago, whether it was reggae clubs to Steppers event or um, uh, just food places and different things. So that was one of my favorite parts of the movie. Also, like growing up, I was a huge fan of Nia Long. That's part of the reason what was driving me when I first moved to LA. I was like, oh, I want a Nia Long career. I want to be the brown skinned girl that is in the, the Love Jones and the Best Man and different stuff like that. Like she was an inspiration to me. So that's part of it. Yo, that's what's up. Yeah, she was, she was definitely like, because for me growing up, like wanting to be a black actress, there wasn't a lot. I think there wasn't a lot of women. I think it was just like Regina King for me. Um, there was Robin Givens. And then when Nia Long came around, I was like, oh, she's in The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. She, she had roles that spoke to me. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's kind of what made that movie my favorite. Also, I'm a, I'm a hopeless romantic. So that was another thing. What's the most romantic thing that a man has done for you? Wow. Um, Not trying to get too deep on you. Yeah, no, the most romantic thing a man has ever done for me. I'm a huge Beyonce fan. And so when I was dating at one point, asked me if I could see Beyonce anywhere in the world, where would that be? And they took me to see her in Paris. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Golly. All right, everybody. That's the bar. That's <laughs> that was the bar. And honestly, that, that bar has made things so hard for me with dating. Like now, every time I date someone new, it's so tricky for me because it's just like, that was a bar. So, yeah. So if anyone's trying to holler at Fatima, Beyonce in Paris is <laughs> a bar. Yeah. Uh, yo, that's really, that's really amazing. Did you see the Eiffel Tower while you were there? I saw that I took pictures in front of it. I, I actually, I was there for 10 days. So I saw all of France. I saw uh, Paris and Marseille and Cannes and mm -hmm. all of the really cool places. Well, there's your next movie right there. See what that see. We need more black love movies where it's like, oh, the brother takes the sister to Paris <laughs> or Morocco. Yeah. Like we don't see we and don't see like that. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. come on now. You, I mean, nobody. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say they're not showing that. I don't know. Honestly, TV and film for me has changed so much in the last couple of years. Like. I don't really feel like there's a lot of things that I really want to see. Do you feel like that too? Whereas like now I'm like, I'm not, I'd rather watch shit on my phone than like actually go pay for a movie ticket. It's really rare for me. It's certain stuff that I will and will like, like right now I'm like, I'll go see Inside Out too, but you won't catch me going to the movies like that. Like I didn't see Bad Boys. Well, I catch them later. Let's put it this way. Um, I'm a cinephile and I have AMC A list, so I can go see movies. Oh, for free. okay. So no, I go, and plus I do a podcast about movies, so it's like I go. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I go and see movies, and also I kind of need to see where where the trajectory of entertainment is going at the moment. But there are there's things I would like to see that hasn't been that's not really being done often. I went I went to see. Um, uh, Lupita Nyong'o had a uh, like a Q&A in Beverly Hills mm -hmm. and I went to see it and there's something that she mentioned she said I want to be in a romantic comedy and like mm -hmm. as soon as she said it I was like I can see it 
Because if you actually like listen to like Mupita have a conversation talk, she's actually really funny. Like she actually has like good like comedic timing and she's like witty and and sharp and all that stuff too. And it's just interesting how because the one thing about being here in Hollywood too is that it feels like people try to pigeonhole you into a lane, right? Mm -hmm. And I that's the issue that I have because I've had conversations with people where they ask me, Well, what do you do? Right. And I don't go down the list. It's like I do IT. I did IT as a day job, but then I also do this. I also do that. And people need to, because people want to know how they can use you. Mm -hmm. So they'll be like, well, what do you do? Well, I do this and this, that. Well, that's not good enough because I, you can't be good at all of those things. Right. So it used to be, it feels like it used to be, you could be a versatile actor where you did comedies and you did drama and you did action and you did that stuff. But now it's like, if you start out one way, because Lupita mentioned, she's like, I won the Oscar and now everyone's trying to get me to do all these drama, all these drama roles. And I want to do like a comedy where I'm silly as fuck. <laughs> and just no one's really like, let me do You know, this I hate to say this. I'm learning that in entertainment. As artists, I think we just, you want to paint everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that we just don't really understand that this business is not what we think it is. And nothing against her, but it's just like, but you aren't a comic. And I'm sure there's so many comedians that can't wait to have that role. Yeah, you're dying for that role, yet you also have those drama roles. It's like, it's as artists, I feel like we want everything that we can't have. It, we don't never be satisfied about the lane that we in. Like, it, I hear that so much in LA that it drives me bonkers. Like, for example, I'll give you a funny, funny example. Have you ever had a conversation with a comic? You sit down with them and they're just like, I'm not doing this. I can't get this. This isn't this. Da, 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 da. It just seems horrible. And you're like, oh, well, da, 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 all you got to do is this. And next thing you know, they're like, but I'm going on tour with this. I got this going on. I'm winning at this. I booked this commercial. I, I'm always on stage. Like, we're not satisfied with the shit we have. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Have you ever been at a comedy club sitting down with another comic that is going to complain for, like, the, the next five, ten minutes about how they hate shit, yet you dive into their life and you're like, damn, bro. You got da 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 da, da and you you still not. Well, and even sometimes I say, so I it's say, like Lapita, we did it. You're an like, Oscar winner. <laughs> you want to be I, funny now? Sometimes but, bro, I go, man, you got. We stuff. love you. I would. You got. You're. Sometimes I have to be like, you have things that I'm working towards. Like I would towards love to be in your position. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, I, and that's and that's the thing that I think humbles me a lot because I feel like oh. Uh, I'll be upset about certain things that are not going a certain way in my career, or I don't have where I would like to be. But that's a personal thing, which everybody has their own personal, mm -hmm. what success is to you. What success to you versus what sex to, success to me is, is two different things. So to me, I'm like, oh, I want to be the star of my own TV show. And I want to be able to put out specials whenever I want. That's what I want. So if my friend is on tour and she's booking hella commercials, I'm not going to hate on that because that ain't really what I want. But there are people in our industry that be mad at that they don't have that. Mm -hmm. They'll look at that and be like, oh, well, she, uh, she has a better life than mine because she's But in reality, that's not even what you even want. You just, you know, it's just, it's a weird... But then it's also this thing, too, where you're like, who he who gets the commercials may not get the TV shows. Yeah. And he who gets the TV shows may not get the commercials. So you kind of got to be in that balance space because that's how it's always felt for me. It's like, oh, well, my homegirl that books every goddamn commercial ain't booking every goddamn TV show. Or she ain't booking the voiceover stuff that I have. Or maybe that person gets every other show, but they struggle at another. Like, all of us are winning, really. We just tend to like look at everybody else's whatever and be like, that's not enough. I'm not where I want to be. Well, like I've realized even for me, just watching other people, like you'll never get where you want to be until you're happy with you. Yeah. Well, we do spend a lot of time like this. 
I'm guilty of this. Every time I get up in the morning, go to the bathroom or whatever on my phone. Oh, look, so and so hey, had, yeah. a, had a show last night. So, and sometimes you can get into that mindset where you get lost. We and you all forget do. about the stuff you gotta do. do that all, thing. We all do, though. But the thing yeah. that I'm noticing with the scene of LA, and I mean this deep because I've gone to other scenes and you, you talk to other people and you're like, they're not even tripping over. I think in LA, it's we live in the we live in Instagram land. Mm-hmm. Some people live on the outside of it where they scrolling and that's the thing. We live in it. We live in Instagram land where popularity is flyers, popularity is views, all that shit. If you don't have those things, you feel less than in this town. Mm-hmm. And some of us are are like for myself are okay with not having being popular or okay with not being thousands of views or like and and i've i've (laughs) this is one thing i think is funny with la i find it that i can see the shit real good like for example like you ever been in a situation where everybody is like oh you're not this or they treat you like you're not doing certain shit and then boom you doing certain shit, and then all of a sudden now everybody like, hey, what's up? I yeah. I experienced that shit so much here. It is just, I find it hard for me to make friends now. I find it hard for me to like be cool with people. That has literally been my essence. I find it because like I'm a reader. I'm not a really big chatty bitch, but like if you act funny towards me because you think I'm not on a certain level, or you think I'm on not on certain flyers, or you think I'm not doing certain shit. I always look at people being like, all right, teach yourself. Because I had a situation happen uh, three, maybe four months ago. People were acting really funny. I had a bombing. I was working on some new jokes. Crazy story. I was working on some new jokes. And I did it at one of my friend's birthday parties. And it bombed. Everybody was like mad mean to me about it. Like, it was really funny. It was interesting to me. Because the first time I ever saw comics treat you differently based off of what they what level they think you at. Due to the fact mm-hmm. that I had a major bombing and everybody was looking at me side eye, I, I saw how people treated me. And how everybody was like, mm. two months later I booked a Netflix fest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then everyone was like, and then everybody oh. was like, hey, you've been killing it. And then, and, then, and then everyone's on Instagram like, we out here working. We out here people, working. Or, or people come up to you and be like, you've been killed. Or people treat you differently and you just be like, damn, I, it, it's the most uncomfortable feeling I've ever had because you just be thinking like, damn, like such and such don't really fuck with me. They just fuck with the success that I have. Yeah. Yeah. So, Love Jones. Let's get back to it. Love Jones. Bohemian Jazz as the soundtrack. I love it. Hip hop cool. I like hip hop, but it was Love nice. It. It's nice to watch a movie that's relaxing. Like it's very oh, it was so relaxing. Like so, so I'm a big city city type person. Like like I lived a bunch of years in Brooklyn. I have family in Chicago, so I've been okay. in, I've been to Chicago. I got family in Hyde Park. Got family on the north side. Um, I spent a lot of my youth in Chicago. I love the Field Museum. Chicago used to be my favorite city because we would come, hang out at Hyde Park, go over to the Field Museum, go get like a hot dog. <laughs> like, like it was just, oh, I didn't really okay. know. I didn't Field really Museum. like the, Yeah, what? you guys, you guys have amazing museums. And as a as a child, I didn't really understand the significance that was Chicago. I was just like, I love everybody here. My family's dope. Their friends are dope. It's a nice, eclectic city that's built on the arts. And I actually went, I was doing the improv. So I went back to Chicago maybe two years ago. Went back to the same place. And I was like, I get it. I get all of my friends that are from Chicago, that are proud about being from Chicago. I'm like, I get it. Like, this place has so much. And I'm talking the black side. I'm talking black Chicago. I'm talking... It has so much to offer. And I feel like I feel like that's what Love Jones captures perfectly. The poetry scene. Like the mm-hmm. I remember the Chicago poetry scene. It reminds it's kind of similar to the DC poetry scene a little bit. 
And I actually had a question for you because you, but you answered it. I asked you, were you like involved in the Chicago jazz poetry scene? Like uh, when you lived there or? No. <laughs> uh, jazz poetry scene? Let me think mm-hmm. that through. Uh, kind of, sort of. I had a really close friend. Nah, I had. I still don't feel cool with her. I have a really close best friend uh, who's into like poetry, but I wouldn't say I was in it like that. You weren't. You weren't a poet. <laughs> so, the two main characters. Bill Bellamy is not a main character, by the way. Hollywood is not a main character. We by said the way. that, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's Darius Love Hall played by Prince Tate, who was also killing it in the '90s, and Nina yeah. Mosley from Nina Long. Ne- your girl, uh, Neil Long, a poet, poet writer. I'll say he's a poet writer, and then she was a photographer. And I think that dynamic was so interesting, and maybe you can um, attest to this in the sense that. It's hard to date as an artist, right? Uh, or no? I wish I could be like, oh yeah, I think it's hard to date in general now. I think that it don't really matter. That's just me. <laughs> All right. I don't think it matters. I think that it's hard to date even when you're not an artist. That's just me. I think there are things to understand about our world that may not be understandable to everybody, but like yeah. that's the same thing for us understanding somebody else's life. Yeah. I mean, I I I did understand I did understand Darius's frustration later on when he was writing his book. Um because at the end, they were like a married couple. And it was like, okay, now it's time for me to get to work. We had all the sex. We did all the things. Now I need to, like, focus, right? So it's like I I, I felt bad for the relationship, and I felt bad for Nina's character. But I also did understand the headspace that he was in, where he's like, okay, I got to, like, really get this draft done. Um, So, like, I, I, I appreciated the the we're artists and we're trying to like have our careers but we're also young and attractive so we are like together but we're not really together we're just kicking it but i'm in love with you because it's much more than just it's not like superficial right um and like the blues for nina scene that's when it started getting like sweaty and that the movie that's when it started getting like hot and sweaty because I was like, this is <laughs> I'm like this is... Mm-hmm. I'm like this is a lot. This is a whole this whole <sighs> this whole place that they're at is like steamy with the music and all that stuff. And I don't know. Has a guy ever swooned? I you think that poetry? I know. Uh I think that the best part of that movie for me was just like unauthentic romance. Uh, somebody putting in the effort in a way that was not the norm. Um, it showcased honesty in their relationship, like toxicity, things that people, like in a short sense, it showcased that nobody was perfect in mm-hmm. their like there was a love there, but nobody was perfect. There were things that he needed to figure out with his life, and there were things that she needed to figure out with hers. I thought that was the best part of that movie. And then for them to circle back and come back to each other, I thought that was the best part. Because I think a lot in relationships, regardless of somebody swoons you or not, I think that's where we're messing up in our generation. It's like there's issues. Everybody has something. But can you can you figure that out? And can both parties have accountability that this is what they needed to figure out? I think there's not enough of that. So I think that's the best part of it. What I will say this is you have to give people chances past the first date. 
Like Glove Jones. Well, yeah, they did that. They was dating, wasn't it? That's what I. That's what I mean. Like Glove Jones is that. Like now, I think since people do a lot of like online dating, they're basically like the first date. I need to make sure everything's perfect on the first date. Oh no, you're right. I have a homegirl to be talking like that. And I'm like, bro, what? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think that they're. You're right. There's a lot of that now where everybody's like so ready to find the flaws that they're not mm-hmm. having a good time enough. Yeah. Your that's shoes true. don't match. You said this. You said this. Yeah. So everyone's like, okay, I'm not really messing with it. But what what uh I will say that like it was definitely a 90s love story because Darius was like weirdly persistent in the sense that he got her information from the check and then he went to her house after she said no, I'm not that interested. That shit was crazy. Yeah, he's like, she she Any literally man said, doing that. <laughs> she nah, said I'm not that, interested. Yeah. It's not a good idea. And he's like, all right. And then, like, yeah. a few minutes later, he's, like, at her door. And not only that, too, he's also, like, so can I come in? <laughs> yeah. I mean. I was, like, yo. Would you let somebody do that to you? Do that to me? Well, I will say this. this is How would of, you feel if a girl was that, like, persistent? If I was interested in the person, yes. If I was interested in the person, mm-hmm. I would definitely i would definitely be yeah i would definitely be interested like i I would be like okay i don't know i feel like now after experiences that i've had i don't know how i feel about dating i think it's changed so much for me like in a mate in a big way i don't know i used to look at that movie and like be like oh this could legit happen or that could legit happen. Like now I'm like, fuck that. Well, it's if somebody it, if somebody try to pursue me that hard, I'm concerned. Well, it, it's definitely different now. And I will say this in my case, as a dude, I would think she was crazy. Cause I would be like, yo, yo, uh, literally don't... 10 months ago, I was like, oh, it's a possibility someone could really be, like, hopeless romantically. No, they could be love-bombing you. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I was like, how did you get into the building? That would be, like, my first question, right? But at the same time, I wouldn't say, if I was interested, I wouldn't say, come in. I'd be like, yo, let's go down here for a cup of coffee. Especially as, like, a man as well, because I also have to protect myself as well, too. Because I don't know this woman, so I'll just be like, hey, let's go to a public place where we can have some tea, and we can talk, and we can figure it out. And I think you're right, too. In 90s, like, I, I've been watching How uh, How I Met Your Mother TV show. It's a whole show about love bombing. It's, oh, I love you, and here's a whole bunch of gifts, and I'm doing some gestures, and then they get into a relationship, and then the relationship just gets boring, right? So then the second time they go on the first date, and where'd they go on the first day? They go to the reggae club. I love that. Which is which I like, but it's also second and third base for black people. If like if you oh, I see. If you go to a reggae club or a reggaeton club, <laughs> that's like that's like you like we're having sex. Yeah, um, it's like all systems go. <laughs> Um, I thought that that would make the movie so cool. I don't know. This was probably one of the best love movies forever. Some people always say like love and basketball, or other shit. I don't know. I think this is one of the best ones. I think if you do go to a club like that, yeah, this is, that's the anticipation that this story built. I was with them. I was with them. I was like, so we go, we going home. Like, what's happening? Like, we go home. I, I, personally, I think this was the most. For black people, this is the realest love story we've seen. I agree. I agree. It was because there were problems, there were issues. For example, she had just got out of a relationship. He had pursued her in a space where she wasn't ready for. It. Then they yeah. found out there was chemistry and there was flaws there. Yes. I, I love I love that this this story went through flaws. Yes. Uh, and then the way that they moved. Yes. Yes. Now what what I wish they had done more, I wish they would have given us more backstory of her previous relationship. Um, what was the guy's name? Um, I forget. Her, her De- no. Uh, 
fuck. Yeah, let me. Uh, I think I want to say his name was Daryl. It was like Daryl or something like that, right? Something like, like that. Something like Daryl or whatever. Um, all I remember was toasted oats. I think. <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, yo, you, you ate all my toasted oats. He could, you could eat no Captain Crunch. He's like, I was hungry. Like, I think that that's the truth of a lot of things with people in relationships. You date someone that it's not working. You know that it's not. This person isn't for you. You meet someone new, but you can't let go. His, his name so is you're Mark. still trying to see Mark. So you go yeah. and see. So I don't know why we call him Daryl. But like, yeah. I thought that part was cool because it was honest. Well, he showed up looking like Arsenio Hall. The the ex? Yeah, the ex. He showed up. I don't with remember. Arsenio Hall face ass. He's like, yo, I need you, uh, I need to talk to you. Come to New York. Now, I will say this. Oh. I have mm-hmm. started a relationship, and this is when I lived in New York. I did start a relationship and I did move shortly mm-hmm. after we started. Mm-hmm. And our relationship has not been the same since. Like we mm-hmm. we we cool and we like talk, but at the same time too, you know, I was in the circumstance where just like my career and stuff kind of like took the circumstances kind of just like ripped me out of Brooklyn and I moved west. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't think about the other person when mm-hmm. I moved and then after the fact I was like, mm-hmm. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm like moving to Los Angeles, right? I I think Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. I'm I I haven't in the last couple years, I haven't been that tight. Like if I, even if it's a a good mutual breakup, I don't really do exes like that. Like I'm, I'm definitely one of them. Like once we, unless, unless it's like, I don't know, maybe the relationship you moved away and we cook. Like I got a, I got one out of every ex I ever have. I have one, and I won't even say it's one that I'm cool with like that. But we mm. cool on Instagram, and ain't nothing really bad happened between our relationship. Like we broke up, but then he like moved back to where he was from, and so he like, you know, support what I'm doing comedy wise. So he'll comment every now and then or something. We ain't like high like that, but for the most part, like watching Nina still have baggage with her ex-boyfriend while she got this new that ain't never been once i say i'm done bitch it's a wrap yeah i mean i i was just as a matter of fact i got amnesia with some of the niggas some of the niggas i dated like i might see you out and be like who (laughs) i i I don't know look i'm just assuming that he just got up and moved to new york and she was like fuck you um here's your engagement ring back i mean she did they never showed us did they they Even never showed did, the reason why. They never why. showed what happened. So as an audience No, she member, says, she goes, something was going on with Daryl, damn, Mark, whatever the fuck his name was, that he Mark. let, he moved. I think it was, I think it was, uh, like any woman had been in a situation where like, with, with most men, I think he got a job and was like, I'm doing this. You need to do this. But she was just like, what about my life type of shit? I think that's what was going on. I what think she was saying like he up and moved, and she was, and he had this attitude of she should up and follow, which is something that I'm learning about men in my my age now. I'm learning that like that's that's why now my idea of that type of love thing, I don't think that's ever gonna happen for me. I used to be like a hopeless romantic, like oh, I used to also be someone to be like oh, I'm gonna have a husband and kids. No, I'm I'm so good. As a matter of fact, I prefer not to be divorced because I know that's what's going to happen. <laughs> I prefer not to have any kids by any man. I prefer not to have stretch marks. No. I think that every man, regardless, even in this movie, regardless of how good a man is, men want you to follow suit of what they're doing. We see this in every fucking movie, whether it's Love Jones, Every man has to be the center of attention. It has to be a certain thing. And I believe that now. I feel like if you're a woman that wants to be married, there's a price you're going to pay for that. If you're a woman like myself who's an entertainer and has her own career and stands for her own shit, 
you might want to reconsider that marriage shit because it's not going to look the way you think it's going to look. This this whole thing of you being an individual and going into a marriage is not real. Well, I think I think there's outliers. I think there's a lot of couples that make it work. Um, but I I do listen. Think... I just look at you like this because I'm like Nina was not trying to go to New York and live with the toast of those nigga because he was he he was already showcasing that he was a controlling psycho. Why can't you eat the toast of oats? He was showcasing out loud that he was like, you gonna come live with me, your little career, you do it, come let me pay the bills, your little career that you want, you do that. Just do what I say in the process. That's 90% of men. 90%? Whether they say that, yes, yes, sir. 90% of men? All right, well, for the other- Okay, ten- then fine, I'll go 70. For the 10, for the 10 or, th- or 30% that's out there, good job. For not, I'm gonna go 70. I'm gonna go 70. Okay, 80. 70, 70. I'm not gonna go yeah, 90. I'm gonna go 70. Out there that are making it work because there are because there are couples that do make it work. There are couples that do make it work. There are okay, there name are, the couples that are successful entertainers that are making it work. And what does that look like? Well, again, I'm I'm detaching, I'm gonna detra- detract from what we see in the media. I was just talking about like general people that we that we don't see in the media or entertainers or whatever. There's something, there's something, there's some couples that are making it work, but usually in a relationship, somebody is sacrificing something. And oh, that's what I mean. Yeah, somebody that's what I mean. And 90% of the time, it's the woman. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean by the 90%. I, I, I'm not I, saying I, 90% of men are whatever I was trying to say. I can't remember. But I'm saying 90% of the time, what I see from my own experience, a lot of my friends that are married are sacrificing things, whether they're the main person that is taking care of the children mm-hmm. or they're the main person that is tolerating certain things from the husband. Mm-hmm. And then when you listen to, like, I have male friends that are married, they feel like they're sacrificing stuff. So what I'm saying is I look at marriage in a completely different eye now. I look at love in a completely different eye now, whereas this movie was, like, the essence of it for me. I don't see it that way now. Like, now I look at it like if I want a prospered life, I think it's best for me to go off and be successful and great in what it is I'm trying to do as Fatima Talia. Mm-hmm. And when I'm ready to stop that, then decide to go have a husband. Well, probably won't have any kids because th- it's gonna be a wrap. But I don't, I don't see as a woman in entertainment. I don't see a man being by that side the way I the same. Well, I think I think that if I think that. If that's what you want, it if that's what you want, it's gonna it might look different. Like, yeah, example, because if you look at reality, how many women in entertainment are like, my husband has been by my side the entire time? It's a very small amount. It's a very small amount, but also those those men are in either different fields or they're on this or they're not seen. You know what I mean? Like 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 Viola Davis's husband. Um he's I think he's her partner in their production company, but he's He's okay with not being seen. Like he's like, look, I'm going over here. I'm doing this business. I'm okay not being seen because I'm over here making money for you, making it work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to a certain extent, <laughs> like ASAP Rocky and like Rihanna, he's like, okay, I'm going to be over here. You, you over here. So, every someone has to make a sacrifice. But at the end of the day, I almost think that Nina ended up making a sacrifice anyway at the end of the movie because she came back to Chicago. From New York. She went to New yeah. York for a photography thing by herself. And, and, that, and that too sits with me differently now. I used yeah. to look at that and be like, man, she never stopped forgetting about him. And so she got his book and she went back there. And he, I, I, I would never do that now. We but don't even know. Yeah. We don't even know if. <laughs> I wouldn't do that now. We don't even but, know if Nina really has a career. Like she did one photo Oh, wait, no, she did great. She. I think she had a career because she says it at the end, like, what about my life? And he says, what about his? And like, we'll make it work. So we don't know who moved where, to be honest. 
Yeah, we don't. They were out in the rain getting their hair wet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like nobody knows what happened. But but still, it's like somebody made a sacrifice. She still came back to Chicago. She did the poem. They saw each other. They fell in love. Ugh. I don't know. That's a lie. Dude. This is this is definitely going to be a point of contention in the podcast. I think people are going to like listen. To I, this I mean, I think nowadays I would love for that to happen to me, but I feel like now it's so tricky. Like, and, yeah. and that's why it's a movie. But like, I feel like now, for example, I, I'm sure you can answer this yourself. How many times in your life would you go back to somebody that it was a conflict or it was a a dis? We we separated from my experience every man that i've ever had a separation from or a breakup from if you go back it's never better it's worse <laughs> it's another reminder that you should never come back here because the wounds because like, the wounds have never healed it's like you think it, that's what it is no i think this is what, what you think is. and this i think From my experience in, in, in life, a lot of times when I have a disagreement with somebody, I don't see the, the things that I've done wrong in that situation until much, much time later, like most. Or you learn from that situation from another situation. Maybe you get into another relationship and you see, oh, that's like for me. I've always learned from the things I've done wrong, from being in another situation and someone does that same thing to me. And then mm -hmm. now I can understand how I made that other pe person feel. Not everybody experiences life like that. I, I have. For, for I've, the crazy thing about me, and I learned this from a recent breakup I had, I care more about other people than I care about myself. My friends and family have just told me that. I'm very much on, if something goes wrong in my life, whether it's a friendship, even at a job, I'm going to look at what I could have done better first before I look at anybody else. That's just me. So a lot of times I, I can't even wrap my brain around what somebody else is doing. I'm too busy trying to figure out how, how I could have done better. And if I learn from the past, the new relationship that I'm in, it's kind of like, well, then why would I go back? So now I could never be me alone. I could never fly to Chicago. <laughs> I had this romantic heart of let me go read this poem in front of this man because now I've learned what the fuck I did wrong, how this other person could have done this better, and why I don't belong here. Have you ever had that? I think now in my life, fuck, I'm not, there have been some amazing loves in my life that I probably would never go back to if they decided to swing, spin the block. Well, I mean, I think, um, I, I would think never, I, I would never let nobody spin the block on me and I'm not trying to spin the block on nobody else because I feel like, I don't know. I just, I don't know. Have you experienced better? Like I have never experienced a nigga better the next time. It's usually uh, like another I, reminder that this is why you don't belong. <laughs> I mean, there's only one or two. I think there's only one or two situations that I regret. But since I've been living in LA, no, there would be nobody. And that's because, and that's because I think I think things here just move too quickly. Like I think people here don't really. I think I think just the last few my years, last situation, I fucked up big time. We moved too fast. I also knew we were moving too fast. I also saw hella red flags and just that's the thing I'm learning about myself now. That's another thing with the knee. Like, for example, she didn't, they both had red flags that they just didn't pick up on. They were young and passionate. His red flags was he's too, he too aggressive on what he wants and not taking the time to see what the fuck y'all really need. What? See, and the thing about Nina, Nia Long's character is that she kept saying no, but kept changing her mind. First, the house. That's me. I don't want to see you. <laughs> he comes to the house. Yeah, you can come in. Hey, I don't want to have sex with you on the first on the first date. But then I do. Let me let me come in for some coffee. 
have sex on the first date. But this is the thing, though. This toxicity on both ends. He doing the most. She trying to play hard to get, but ain't really playing. Then she dates his friend. Let's get into Bill Bellamy's character. See, Here we then, go, guys. Then, so, Tap in. You know, so Wood is awful. <laughs> like, he was, but do you think... Here's the thing for me. I've been... I ain't never... I've been mad at dudes. That's the... Man. That's the shit about me that I'd be like, I gotta get more meaner and more shadier. But <laughs> I ain't never... I ain't never in my life been so mad at a dude. I'm gonna mess with his friend. I thought that was real wild of her. I yeah, I think I think Nina and Nina was, go to the party and be like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you brought me here." He here, girl. The, so so the thing about Darius is that I I feel like I mean they both have issues, but I feel I feel like Darius had a little bit. I don't want to say emotional intelligence, but he seems like he had a better hold of things because the thing about the thing about Darius, if you notice, Bill Bellamy was the horn dog. Like he was the one that was like, I'm going to try to sleep with everything, blah, blah, blah. And Darius was really about his work. And I think his biggest sin is that he wasn't honest with himself. Like he wasn't honest that he was really in love with this girl. He wasn't honest with his his work life balance, right? He wasn't really honest about like his emotions, and he wasn't honest about like his anger issues, right? Now he never like blew up and did anything on a Tyler Perry level or anything like that to her. But at the same time, as a man, I've learned recently the importance of not making your significant other feel like she's neglected because women's feelings matter, right? So it's it's not necessarily about what has happened in your mind, because in, in our minds, we see things literally. Like, we see things as they happen, what happened. I can replay the whole scenario. So you might say to me, hey, this, I felt this and this and this. And it's like, who cares how you felt? This is what happened. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So... So, like, that's kind of the way that he, like, navigated their relationship, where he was like, I never did X, Y, and Z, blah, 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 so I don't know why you tripping. But then she's like, yeah, but you made me feel. Because remember that whole conversation that she had with her friend, it was basically, and I know I know y'all be having these conversations, you and your girlfriends. If he, if he cool with it, he really ain't, <laughs> he really ain't into you, and you need to make sure he knows what I mean, that it. it... <sighs> No, I don't even, as an adult, seeing that, you like, oh, this was the petty part of the relationship. This should have been like a, a honest thing, an honest question. I don't know. There and were for, parts of that. There were parts of that that, that's why I like the movie so much. There were parts of that that I think that were so real, of how we deal with things, of how we like save face with each other, and we don't really be honest with each other. And like people are so worried about what someone's gonna think, or if I'm doing too much, or if I'm showcasing too much, like that. Yeah. Well, because people do get weird about that. Like I have, I, I, texted, I, I have, think if you get weird about that, then stop dating. Then I, I have texted, I have texted the girl one too many times, and it hasn't been like a lot in a day. It might be, I might text her once a day or something like that and that's too much right or i don't text i don't text enough or i don't call on the phone or i don't you know what i mean so so it's the balance so i could see where he's coming from where he's like yo i don't want her to think that i am too that my nose is wide open so when she says to me that she's going to 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 see another dude i don't want her to think i'm like some possessive jealous Type. No, that that was more of he wasn't. They had been dating for a while. This is a movie to us. I I took it as they had been dating a little over six months, and he hadn't said be my girlfriend. So she's like, well, shit, my ex is trying to see what's good, and I'm a woman who's trying to be like married or some shit. Mm -hmm. Let me go see what's good with that because you're not even showcasing. You're fine with us just kicking in and fucking. Let me check in and be like, hey. I'm about to go do the XYZ. How do you feel? That 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 was her way of being the same shit he's doing. Like, I don't want to seem thirsty, but let me tell you that like there's other options and you ain't necessarily trying. Like, it's like, when do you know? It was a temperature check. It was a temperature it, check. It was a temperature, it was a temperature check. check. 
But at the same time, too, he was trying to be like, well, I ain't trying to like and and that's what I'm saying, like being honest, like if he because. And this is and this is the difference that you see in like white romance movies and like black romance movies and white romance movies. The joke is always the dude says, I love you too soon. So like the first date, the white dude said, I, I had love that you. happen to me recently. OK, <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you a wild little story. So I had a situation recently where it looked like it could be a good look. The person said they loved me like really fast. It kind of scared me a little bit. I still took my time because I was like, I don't want to just start saying this because they said it. Mm -hmm. Let's be authentic about it. I'm afraid of those things now. And I was at the time. If so, and, 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 they, and to how this ended, I, I was love bombed. Yeah. You got to be careful. Like with that, that person too. saying they love me within three months. And yeah, you got to, you got to be. I think I think that's reality. That's why Love Jones to me is such a staple. It's like, what was she supposed to do? Mm -hmm. What was he supposed to do? Well, actually, let me take that back. As a grown ass woman, I feel like men, when they want something, and in the world we live in now, you just gotta kind of say that. If you don't, then you you are open to being a part of what was going on. Truth I mean, be told, it's, I mean, truth be told, it's Darius's fault. That he did not be like, yo, I'm fucking with you. I don't want you to do this. Yeah. I feel this way about you. The fact that he didn't, what is one supposed to do? As a woman, if you're dating a man periodically, like the way I think the storyline was going for the movie, they have been dating for a while. It's on the man. Women, women are programmed. This is the th this, let me just whoever's watching this, I feel like men scream on a daily, women don't want to let us leave. The times have changed to where women are so independent and they won't let us leave. You hear that? You hear men say that so yeah. often. To like, yeah. when we let y'all leave and y'all don't, then you mad because she doing something else and then you say, oh, well, she's this, that, and the third. You're not leading. If you was trying to lead her to being the queen you actually see her being, you believe in your heart, then treat her as such and bring her into that. If you want to still keep playing games because you scared of she, then I, I think, what are we doing? What are we I doing? Because I don't I, think women, and I don't mean to cut you off, because no, I don't no, think that I'm women sorry, are, none of my homegirls that are successful and beautiful are playing games. I haven't heard none of the grown women out here be like, I'm not going to tell him that I like him because of this. I'm not going to be. I don't have any friends that are doing that. I feel like a lot of men are still out here trying to play this game. And like, if, but even in the movie, it's like if he, if Darius really felt like she was that bitch, then why you even make her that bitch? You let, well, you led her to leaving. You led her to your friend. And what's funny about Darius is Darius wasn't really like a player like that. You know what I mean? Like, it would have been something different if this but was, his like, level of insecurities and confidence yeah. led that bitch to his homeboy. It, it, it's almost like like the movie Boomerang is the opposite, where, like, Eddie Murphy's just getting a whole bunch of women, and then he's yep. like, oh, I'm trying Boom, to I like this one. I like this one, so I'm trying to sell it out. But Darius wasn't any of that. He was just a writer. Like, I like this movie, too, because, let's face it, these are, just, these are a bunch of, like, black nerds. That are hanging in Chicago. They, they were blurred. Flag. But it also showcased, ooh, I'm glad you said that. It also showcased that Darius really liked her and he saw the potential in that relationship, but he was more concerned about his book. Yeah. That, he was well, more concerned about his book and he was more concerned about his career. So he couldn't see the love that was smack dead in front of him. Instead, he noticed more of the flaws that she had. So when they became a couple, Ooh, when they, broke shit down. When when they like, really became a couple, then that's when everything started going to shit. Darius became mean. Nina you know what? I'm about to tear some shit up in my apartment. Let me tell you something. That, wait. <laughs> I guess, I gotta cut you off. Okay, so I just experienced something very similar. I was dating in comics, not going into names. 
beautiful relationship in the beginning. But two people had their own personal things going on. I had some things going on in my personal life with my job, things I felt about my career, personal things were going on with my family. And I was trying to navigate that all in the process of where my success is now. He was in the process of trying to elevate his career and that was very important to him. Mm -hmm. But he failed to showcase how much more that's, that was important than me or how much more that success and what he wanted to gain out of that was more important than me. Mm -hmm. And then what I saw from this movie is the same thing I feel like I went through. Darius was going through a tough time in his career with the book. So when she came around, she was almost like something to make him feel better about it. Yeah. And the conflict of that was he ended up liking what he thought that was just supposed to be a band-aid of how he felt about not getting the book out. If we go back and look at the movie, he talks about how to his friends consistently how he's trying to get the book out. Then he sees this beautiful girl in the thing and he pursues that. That distraction helps him not feel bad about how the book's not coming out and he uses her for that. Yeah. In the process of that, she's hurt from her past relationship and she's using him to get over that. I have to, Ooh, I have to admit. They both were using each other for different things and then found love in the process and didn't, nobody wants to admit that what they discovered is something yet they both have their own issues. That's exactly what, what I just dealt with. It was I, like, she's, she's fighting what she lost with this ex that she yes. thought that was going to be a one thing and her career is in a certain space and her family life. All these things are going down. He's not feeling confident as a man because he didn't get the book out, but he needs something to build his ego, and she's that. When he yes. realizes that she's not fully what he thought she was because there's another man, now he's going to find flaws in her. When in reality, she truly, like, it's a wild... And, and it was also after that she, she dated his friend, too. Because remember, when they became like... The dating couple... the friend part, I feel like, was messy on her part, but I also yeah. think that had a lot to do with just her anger of men, which every woman has gone through that. I've gone through that, too. I think it was like the ex-boyfriend was an asshole to her. You find somebody that you're really in love with, and you come back, and you, after going to visit that, and you find out he's dating somebody that quick, because that's what set that off. You do remember why that was the case. I mean, was she, she dated really the dating friend because she came he back, like... and he was fucking old girl. He was yeah. He was kicking it with another chick. No, no, kicking it. He was, he was kicking he it. He was fucking somebody else after all That's that, and they didn't show it in the movie. But as a woman, we've all experienced a nigga pouring into you and making you feel like you're that bitch, and then you she didn't even tell him where she's going. Cause you know, in the movie, it's just like I'm gonna go poke around and see if I can find. He don't even know that's the case. He assumes she thinks that he's fucking with her. She leaves, comes back. And he's fucking another bitch. Meanwhile, she never said she was going to fuck another dude. So uh, to the, see that, it's like, the what? Last, the last few moments of the movie, I did not like how Darius was treating my baby. I was like, I always, okay, so I always feel bad for Nia Long. Like, when she was younger, I used to feel bad for her and, like, all of, because she has that voice that will do her wrong. It makes you, like, feel bad for, because it's kind of like. Not her voice. The, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm trying to get you to see the point. The point of the matter is, can you imagine saying to somebody, I'm going to go to New York, poke around. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm going to go fuck with nobody. I come back, it's another bitch. And it's the bitch that was the name that was on your refrigerator. I know the movie back to, I know the movie back to the back of my hand. <laughs> Wait, what was her name? Uh, I Lisa? forget her name. Lisa. Her name was Lisa. Lisa. She had already had assumptions about Lisa. You don't even know I'm going to mess with the ex-boyfriend. His friend said she gone because she's about to mess with another nigga. They assume that's in the mood. Mm -hmm. And if she comes back and she sees you fucking another bitch, and she's like, all right, bet. Your homeboy, it was messy. It was a messy move. But in reality, 
He never said how he felt about her. She never said she was going to fuck another nigga. And boom, you fuck another bitch. What you expect her to do? I'm just saying. Tell me I what mean, your I thoughts are. I wasn't saying he was right. I'm just saying. I just didn't like how he treated her. Like I, I think like... everybody was wrong. That should have been your answer. Your answer was everybody was on some bullshit. What was, what she... was my answer? I said I like how he wasn't her. right. But in reality, they both was bogus. She yeah, should have. She both, knew she liked him and didn't say. Instead, she played a lame ass game of I'm gonna go poke around yeah, to see how lame. he would react. And then he was corny for being like, "Yeah, go do your thing, whatever." It was lame for sure. It was lame. Another thing. Okay, so before we wrap up, because we gotta wrap up soon. <laughs> every every ro- Yeah, we could talk for this. Could be like a Joe Rogan. I know. Book. Level podcast, four hours about Love Jones. Um, I love this movie. Every romantic comedy always has its couples that have their ebbs and flows and ups and downs. When there's a couple that's established in every romantic comedy, that relationship takes when the main character's relationship goes up. That's Savon and his wife. Even though they don't really like focus because they don't really show his wife that much. She's like in one scene and then in the next scene, she's leaving. And we don't know how do they, how do they insinuate that It was like over money or something, right? What you talking about? Savon's wife. She takes her their son. And oh leaves. my god! Okay, so he wasn't a good guy. I'm I'm sick of it. Like he was. He had. Um, it was something about financial something stability. Or something was, was going on with him or about that. But he also was caught with another woman. I think within a movie, something somehow well, they said she that left, he starts showing up at the poetry club with another chick. Yes, a chick he works with because he's a teacher. He's a teacher, and it's like another. I was like, no, before. his story was corny and not good. And they're like, it was like uh, he was something was going on where she wanted more of something, and then instead of him just, which I, this is what I can't stand about men. This is why we have this hard time of dynamics. I think that like instead of him really seeing what she needed and what she wanted he was just like oh well she's tripping i'm gonna go hang out with this teacher how does this make anything better she's like she's gonna take my son she's gonna take my son be with her mother Uh, and of course this is also like a movie too so he's like yeah she's gonna take my son be, be with her moms and then she'll come back and then so how the movie wraps up is that the movie weird? wraps up. In other words, women once again cater to stupid ass niggas that they shouldn't have. They come back to them to Chicago and they come yes. back home with their kids. Yes. And you deal with the bullshit that they, if there was a yes. part two, it would be still terrible. And then they go, <laughs> you know what? We'll, we'll both make it work. All right, let's kiss in the rain. And that's what everybody wanted in because we hope for the best. But in reality, Nina, stay where in New York. Um, I love you. I love you, Nia Long. <laughs> I love her too. She's yeah. so beautiful. Uh, I just one of my favorite movies. I don't know. In the end of the day, we all hope for that hopeless romantic love. I you don't know. know. Do you think should we end it on this? Do you think that exists? I mean, to be honest with you, my my chemistry is hope is like a romantic type. Like I've really tried to do the. Oh, what's your sign? Let's end on that. What's your sign? All right, oh, you, so you're I, Cancer. I'm a Cancer, Cancer gang, Cancer Leo Cus. My birthday July 21st, so that means I'm a Cancer Leo Cus. What? What's your sign? I am an Aquarius, but I am so deep into the zodiac stuff that I am a Cancer Moon. Uh, oh, so wow. I lead with Cancer energy. I have very sensitive energy. Um, and I think my rising is Leo. So my Venus is just Chicago, uh, just uh, it is Chicago, but it's just Aquarius. I don't know a whole lot about Zodiac. So you're going to have to explain. Uh, that you aren't what you, your first thing is apparently. I don't, I had an old roommate okay. who used to put me onto this. Uh, I'm an Aquarius, but I don't uh, thrive up that. When I tell people that I'm an Aquarius, they go, oh, you're detached and like aloof. And I'm like, not really. I'm like super sensitive and like very like, so I lead more as a Cancer. Than anything. Well, so I like understand your sign. So like I'm a romantic. I am. I'm a romantic. Yeah, like I, I I grew up like my parents have been together for since 69. So they've been together for 50 something plus years or whatever. Um 
my dad has always taken care of the family. So like in my mind, I'm always like, yeah, I would like to get married and be able to give my wife. And if I have any kids, the freedom to do whatever they want, but they don't have to worry about anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of tough now because you can't get a house for $40,000 anymore. That's uh, a different thing. Yeah. So, so like I've, imagined being like a fuck boy you know like being out here in la like i've That's been like, oh, i would like to go out and just mm -hmm. all eyes on me and i can talk to every woman i see and all that stuff but i don't have the chemistry for that i don't have the i don't have the want for that like it's very hard for me to just be now i'm not gonna say that i haven't been I could have, I have, de I could definitely have been more emotionally available to women in my life before. Like, I'm not going to say I'm nice to everybody. That's not true at all. But um, it's hard for me to be like detached from people that I'm like involved with. So if I don't have the means to be, if I don't have the means to be involved with somebody, I don't do it. Like, I, 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 I would rather just chill. And yeah. write and work focus <laughs> on my career and stuff like that. So I mean, I don't know. Like I, I think I, I think I would be a ro. You know, I am kind of a romantic. I in my mind, I think I'm a romantic, but we'll see. <laughs> How about you? What's up? Um, I'm definitely in a hopeless romantic, but I think a lot has going to change after this last situation. Uh. I think I learned that I don't set boundaries very well. I don't set boundaries very well. And I'm not really good at like understanding that there's in one hand, you can be an understanding person and want to love everybody and give everybody chances. But there's another one where you have to be selfish and protect yourself. And I've fucked up a lot of times with that. Because I am so used to giving people chances because that's what I want for myself that I do it so mm -hmm. often. So I need to take a step back, I think, for a little while. You know, if I'm going to go back into this, be the person that I was. Because I just think I, I'm so understanding. In my last two relationships, you know, I feel like I allow people to treat me a certain way and I, and I always find excuses for it and then when the shit hits a fan I'm the one that gets hurt in the end so I don't know that's where mm -hmm. I'm at I think eventually we'll get back to where we need to be but right now I think I'm gonna just reevaluate how I approach romantic situations and try to reevaluate them. you do have to take care of yourself I, I haven't been I, I, I will be honest, I, I've always been, I mean, I'm an older sister and I, I don't know, I've always been a very like, even when it comes to comedy, I'm noticing that too from this situation. I've always been a very like real authentic person with people. Mm -hmm. And like, I always want to know, it's not about industry stuff to me too. I'm always like, how are you for real? And I feel like, I think I'm saying that in a way where people genuinely are feeling that. But I find it that I'm learning now that I'm the only person being that in situations. And that's uh, bothering. Do, yeah. that's, that's fucking with me. I think in my career now and in my relationship now, I'm noticing that like when I ask someone how they are or if I'm being a genuinely good person to people, that's really me. And, and when I, I get mad when I don't get it back. And I got to like, that's my own fault, though. You're definitely a cancer. For sure, I, I be that's feeling that way you, too. That's why I was like, I, I, I leave with can't like because I, I found myself hurt a lot in the industry, or just around comics and relationships a lot because I feel like I'm not somebody that's gonna be there for you or genuinely tell you that I love you if I really don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're very beautiful, very funny. <laughs> you have a great taste in movies, great Thank smile, you. and. If you're if you're trying to holler at Fatima, Beyonce, and it's Paris, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the bar. That's so we're about to wrap up, but uh, uh, Fatima, tell the people where they can find you. 
Uh, I'm everywhere all the time in Los Angeles. Definitely. Uh, I will be at the comedy store on June, ele- July. We're in July. Shit. So fast. July 11. Uh, and then I'll be at the ice house, uh, Los Angeles on July 13th and some other private shows throughout the month, July 16th. So I have a lot of shows coming up. Please follow me on all of my social media platforms, Fatima Talia, to find out where I will be. Awesome. Thank you for, uh, uh, join us and we'll, and I'll do my little closeout thing. Uh, yeah, everybody, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Cultured Podcast. I had a lot of fun with this episode. This episode this is hilarious. We was talking. We got yeah. deep. We got this deep about we got relationship deep. issues. <laughs> Every we talked about relationships. We got. We're gonna have. We're gonna have uh, Fatima back for sure because this Please. this it was top tier. But you. you can you can follow me on all socials, Keaton J. Floyd. You see it down there in the corner. Follow the podcast at Cultured Pod on Facebook and on Instagram. Uh, on YouTube, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Tell your friends to join us for this podcast. And also, again, once again, if you're in the West Hartford, Connecticut, and New York City area, September 14th, I will be headlining two shows at the Elbow Room. Uh, link in the bio for tickets and also the 15th i will be at saint mark's comedy club headlining tickets are on sale now first three shows of my little tour i'm doing called everybody's oh i can't even get the name of my tour right everything (laughs) under control so thank you so much for joining us fatima of course thank you for having me i appreciate it this is great and thank you for watching cultured y'all be good